podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Some Holocaust survivors now call North Carolina home. Esther got the chance to talk with one of them, Morris Glass, and the son of a survivor, Mike Abramson. Joining me is Mr. Morris Glass, who's a survivor of several concentration camps, and Mr. Mike Abramson, who's the chair of the North Carolina Council of Holocaust, and also a child of a Holocaust survivor. Thank you so much, both of you, for talking with us. Mr. Glass, let's start with your story in Auschwitz. And you were born in Poland, and at the age of 14, we were taken into Auschwitz after they liquidated the ghetto and Lutsch. We came in with our mother and father, my two sisters and my brother. I was the youngest in the family. And the men were separated from the women and we faced the infamous Dr. Mengele. After I got through the selection, miraculously because I was very young, my mother and my two sisters went to the left. I waved to them, and I never saw them again. And this was right in Auschwitz, and, and I, Dr. Uh, Joseph uh, Mengelen, who's renowned... He was in charge. Doctor, made the selections, and when you waved to your family, what were you thinking? Well, I was hoping that uh, somehow we survive. They survived, but didn't happen. I never saw them again. We were taken to the uh, showers and we were, oh, we had to shed all our clothes and we were given a stripe, uh, a shirt and a pair of pants and we were taken into the camp of Birkenau, Auschwitz. My brother was sent away to a camp up in, in northern Germany and my father and I were sent into a camp called Kaufering which was a satellite of Dachau. After being there a few weeks, we were sent into another camp called Kaufbeuren, which was also a sat satellite of Dachau. And that was what the Germans called a Vernichtungslager, means a death camp. Out of 1,550 people, there's a mass grave of 435, including my father, that were murdered. My father was very brutally beaten to death, and when his body was still warm, they pulled his gold teeth from his mouth. And I, to pay my final respect to my father, I volunteered for the burial commando, which consisted of a, 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 of a blanket with four people holding every end. And we just walked to this big pit. We dropped, there were four or five people weighing almost nothing. And then we sp spread some Clorox or whatever, and, and was ready for next day. About a hundred so much survived out of the 1,550 that were originally in that camp, and we were then taken to Dachau. And then in Dachau, of course, uh, we, we thought they're going to take us straight to the crematoriums because that's when, when we walked towards it, and the smell of burning human flesh is very distinct. You cannot cannot be mistaken with anything else. And in Auschwitz, they had four big crematories operating 24-7. And of course, you couldn't help but wonder whose turn was next. You lived in constant fear. Of course. Uh, and and it, it, what, what killed uh, most of them, of course, is the disease, dysentery, of typhoid, and the beatings. I've read uh, some essays of Holocaust survivors, and one thing that some of them mention that they had this intense will to survive, and that's why they survived. Some hid, some did other things to survive, but how did you survive? I was very fortunate. I, I must say, uh, I'm, 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 I'm no hero. I guess it, it was just God's will because there were. As you know, many, many millions, especially among the six million Jews, were one and a half million children, and many, many millions of others who uh, 
who, who were executed and died very brutally, a lot of them with their sadistic uh, experiments, uh, who were also in charge by Dr. Mengele. Did uh, you have any experiments on you? No. Yeah, I, I wish, uh, I wish they, they looked for a more perfect specimen of man who they performed the, the uh, experiments on, and women and children. But I was fortunate enough. In the end, when uh, the infamous Adolf Eichmann made this, his, made, his plan was what they called the final solution of the Jewish people, and they're supposed to be taken to South Germany on the border of Austria, and that's where they supposed to get poison in the food, and by the time the Americans would come in, there would just be a, a, a mountain of ashes. And I uh, escaped. And I was uh, hidden by Catholic How nuns. How did you escape? It, time does not allow us to, to tell the story. I, I, but uh, being that there were so, so many wounded and so many sick dying, they allowed us to go for water. And under the, the pretense of going to water to a farmer, this farmer hit, there were five of us. Mm -hmm. And one of them was very bad, he was dying, so we went to this hospital. And the Catholic nuns, hit us. And on April the 28th, I watched the first American tank coming up the hill. And how can I possibly describe the jubilation? <laughs> and how can I describe of the feeling of being free? But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the American Armed Forces who the life we own to them because of the heroic fighting and their sacrifices. We are here today. And every survivor owes their life to the American Armed Forces. And every child born after the Holocaust owes their freedom to the American Armed Forces. I just want to say to the young people in the audience, you are the future of this greatest land on earth. And it's in your hands to make sure that something like that should never happen again, not only to the Jewish people, but to no people on earth. And Mike, one of the things that your organization does is try to educate the public about the Holocaust. Right. How do you do that? Well, the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust presents teacher workshops and trains teachers, public school and private school teachers, how to teach the Holocaust to students. We also have resources centers around the state in Burgoff and ECU at Greenville and Mars Hill College where students and teachers can check out library materials. How do you answer, and this goes to both of you, there's some people that say that the Holocaust never happened and it should not be taught in schools. What do you say to that? Well, I, I would go anywhere in this world and I'd face anybody and let them tell me that the Holocaust never happened. I, I'm the only survivor out of about a family of close to 100, including aunts, uncles, cousins, first and second cousins. I don't even have a third cousin. And I like to know what happened to those people. And the mass graves that are still uh, were found after the war, of course, ashes doesn't make, don't make very good witnesses. But there is uh, a place called Bad Verolsen, who they gonna open to the public now, who have very exact records because the Germans kept very good records of 15 million people. And that's going to be open in a couple of months to the public. Have you been back to Auschwitz? Yes, I have. What was that like? It was a terrible experience. I, I couldn't stop crying and I was shaken. I, on, I went for the main purpose because my wife is a third generation American and I wanted her to see what Auschwitz and then of course we also went to Dachau. We went to my hometown where I played as a, as a young boy. Mike, tell me about the North Carolina population of Holocaust survivors and how predominant are they? Well, we don't have a whole lot of survivors in the state. We estimate only about 50 survivors. And we try to use the survivors in real life public testimony to the students and the teachers. And I'd like to emphasize that the Holocaust highlights the importance of tolerance and tolerance education. And the Holocaust teaches us what happens when a society hates 
and when a society values hate education and teaches its children to hate. Mr. Morris and Mike, I, I know we can sit here and talk for a very long time, but thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you very much. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV.